approach. The church it actually took six, seven centuries before the church had a rough outline of what the canon would be. And even into the seventh century, one of the great Eastern theologians, one of the first systematic theologian writers, St. John of Damascus, even his canon was different from the rest of the church. But most people don't reject St. John of Damascus. We certainly don't in the Orthodox Church. So if you look at the progression of the formation of the canon itself, you're led to the conclusion that if you're a Protestant, a fallible group of men put together an infallible canon. Okay. Um, not going to be spending a whole lot of time on all these because, again, uh, I've given you references to to look at for some of these things. But this will help you understand why R.C. Sproul says some of the things he said that sometimes leave people confused. And this is why um, uh, Michael Kruger and I, two years ago, yeah, two years ago, uh, coming up week after next, uh, at the G3 conference, did what we did on the subject of the canon. And again, I would highly recommend that to you, um, that discussion that we had and Michael Kruger's books, because the idea of infallible men as the source of the canon is one of the key errors of both Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox, and Roman Catholic argumentation. You need to know what the canon is. And again, I, I don't know how many times I've given the presentation on Canon 1, Canon 2, what these things are, what the, the theological nature. They're not my favorite presentations. Favorite for other people. Because they don't recognize the importance of understanding that the Canon is a theological construct before it's a historical construct. Uh, Rome and Eastern Orthodoxy will use it as a historical issue. Um... And hence what this father said and what that father said and this person, that person, so on and so forth, rather than recognizing that canon is directly related to inspiration and to the actions of God, and therefore it's God that determines canon, and the church is the passive recipient, not of a divine revelation of the canon, but of the canon itself. So the, the list of the canon is what's, what I've called an artifact of revelation, God-inspired at least one book, but he didn't inspire all books. Therefore, the canon comes into existence of necessity by the limit, by the action of inspiration and the limitation of that action of inspiration. Um, add that one to your list. There's two sections, a bunch of, bunch of stuff that's super relevant in Scripture alone to this subject. Um, very, very important that you get some of those foundational issues down. It's ultimately nonsense. It's ultimately contradictory. It doesn't work. So what we have here is the assumption of tradition. And tradition comes to us in two forms. There's an oral form and there's a written form. The written form being, of course, the scriptures themselves and the liturgies. And this is something I didn't understand as a Protestant. I didn't understand the importance of the liturgy that even went into the decision as to what books would be included in the canon of Scripture, which... Again okay, now th th this is where you have the orthodox spin on this particular... Because the argument is very, very similar to that which Rome would use. Um, but this is the orthodox spin, is because in orthodoxy... See, orthodoxy... I, I didn't say this earlier, but let me say it now. From my perspective, orthodoxy is encrusted in the tradition of time and is essentially stuck at the end of the 8th century. And many of the problems that it faces, and it faces many problems, and once people get into it, they realize just how fractured and divided it is, and uh, it, it, you know, it, it's presented one way, especially to the West. You go to the East, and it's, it's lived out in a very different way. Um, but the divisions that exist there... I don't think can be healed because the fact that orthodoxy is stuck in history. It is stuck in the liturgy and tradition of the ninth century, seventh and ninth century. And it can't go beyond that. It can't get beyond that. And that tradition eventually overrides the life giving power of scripture as the living voice of Christ in the church and overshadow scripture. It becomes not just a lens, 
But it's like when a person gets a cataract. When you get a cataract, the lens becomes foggy. It, it becomes, it's no longer perfectly transparent. And so that's how the liturgy and tradition in orthodoxy functions in looking at Scripture. And the, the voice of Scripture becomes muted. That's, that's why Rome, in its infallibility, enters into a monologue. There's no longer, there's no longer, it's just the voice of the Church, sola ecclesia. And in orthodoxy, you end up with sola traditio. That tradition and that liturgy becomes so fixed that it fossilizes. And like the lens, it becomes thick and no longer transparent, and you can't see what the scriptures are actually saying. There can be no correction. Their semper reformanda means always reforming because the reformers recognized the true nature of man. And this is one of the primary heretical errors of orthodoxy, is it has a fundamentally unbiblical anthropology, a fundamentally unbiblical anthropology, doctrine of man. And because it does, it cannot be corrected because the lens through which it looks at Scripture filters that out. That's why sola scriptura is so important. Because sola scriptura allows the church to continuously hear the voice of Christ in Scripture for each and every generation without that becoming um, muted. Okay, now we're using hearing rather than seeing, but you see, the, you see the relationship. Without it becoming muted through tradition, without that lens becoming so thick that it filters out the things that would correct the errors that the Church is now embracing. And when it comes to soteriology, the doctrine of man, and again, we're speaking as Westerners, the doctrine of man is communicated and understood through the liturgy and traditions of the 7th through 9th centuries in the East for the modern-day faithful Eastern Orthodox person. And so there can't be a correction because you've denied Sola Scriptura. There it is again. Um, very important aspect to, to keep in mind.